Well, good evening to everyone. Nice to have you with us tonight. And another beautiful day. Got a nice shower about halfway through the day. Wasn't that nice? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so nice it let me finish cutting my grass before it poured. Uh, <laughs> it was such a nice thing. You know, usually it's like the second I turn the lawnmower on, it, it lets go. So I was able to get it all done. And that was a wonderful thing and a great opportunity to get the, the grass all cut. And I hope that you've had a good day and got all of the projects done that you wanted to get done and have enjoyed some of that beautiful sunshine that we've had the last few days. I went out the other day, it didn't last long, but I, I just lay down on the grass in the backyard, did one of those summer snow angel things, you know, <laughs> and uh, I thought, now I know why those dogs do that. That felt so nice, it itched my back and everything, I thought, well, it works out pretty good. So. Uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, days, the last two days, and I guess we have rain tonight, tomorrow morning, and then it'll be nice again for two more days, three day, more days, so looking forward to that. Uh, glad that you joined us tonight. <clears throat> if you're just joining with us, we are involved in a study on the second coming of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> and uh, this was in response to questions that have been asked, the second coming, the rapture, the one and the same. When will the second coming be? And can someone get saved after the rapture? Those, so all those questions came from two different people. We've been trying to answer it, but we did a deep dive uh, in our subject of the second coming. 
And we came up with this, that the main subject of the Bible is kingdom. It's important to understand why there is a first and second coming, and so that's what we did. And uh, we found out that the, um, the uh, main subject of the Bible is the kingdom. It was given to Adam, he lost it. Uh, Abram, he lost it. Judah, he lost it. David, he lost it. We could go on through the whole list. Then began the times of the Gentiles, and uh, represented by the uh, uh, image that Nebuchadnezzar had in his dream. Each one of the sections of that image represented a different successive kingdom of the times of the Gentiles rule kingdom. And uh, the dream that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had that was interpreted at the end of the image, a stone rolled off of a, a mountain, uh, hit the ten toes, destroyed the ten toes, and in doing so set up an eternal kingdom. So when we're studying about the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ, and we want to know what or why, it's important that we understand the main subject of the Bible is kingdom. Uh, that is the main thought, the main subject of the Bible. And then, good evening. And uh, so, after establishing this, we said, okay, uh, Jesus came the first time, and uh, we looked at all the references and saw that Jesus came the first time for the purpose of establishing his kingdom. John the Baptist came out as the forerunner. Uh, it was prophesied to do that. Uh, he was the forerunner after he came out and was prophesied as the forerunner. Um, we even read where Jesus said that he was, John the Baptist was, Elias, prophesied in the Old Testament, Malachi, Isaiah 40. And then he put a little caveat to it, and that is, the kingdom suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force, and if you believe it, or if you receive it, then this is Elias. So what he's saying is if the nation of Israel would receive the kingdom, instead of trying to take it by force, if they would receive the kingdom through the offering of Jesus Christ, then John the Baptist would have been Elijah. Uh -huh. Of course, we know that he they didn't. John 1, 11, came to his own, his own received him not, and so they rejected Jesus Christ. And so, instead of being the first coming of Jesus Christ to set up this kingdom, they rejected the kingdom. John the Baptist's preaching was about the kingdom. Jesus' preaching was about the kingdom. Everybody's focus was on the kingdom. Even after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, they said, will you at this time restore the kingdom again to Israel? They never got kingdom off of their mind their focus was always on the kingdom. The Jews never looking for a savior who would die for our sins and take our sins upon himself and live in us through his Holy Spirit. No Jew ever saw that in the Bible. Never. They weren't looking for it. That's the reason they could stare Jesus right in the face, hear him say, Nicodemus, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And then explain to him about the spirit operation of the new birth and it went choo, right over the top of their head they, they could not get it they just they weren't looking for that and so um, Jesus even scolded Nicodemus are you a master in Israel and you don't know these things okay he said you know you should know this way put over the top he came they rejected the kingdom and so we made the statement that Jesus' first coming was to set up the kingdom, but the kingdom did not come because of the rejection. Now, what this is referred to sometimes in some people is postponement. I don't know if there's an E in there. If you don't like the E in there, you can take it out, okay? Um, but postponement theory. The postponement theory is that Jesus came to the Jew. The Jew rejected him. And so he's going to come back again the second time for the Jew. But it's postponed by X amount of years. The P 
people that refer to this as the postponement theory don't mean that in a positive way. They mean that in a negative way. It's like a mockery. Oh, you're one of those postponement people. Okay? And uh, they just, in their mind, they can't get that. That if you look at, he came in his own, his own received him not. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. People cannot wrap around their head that those two verses are two different things came to his own. Who's that? Jews or Gentiles? Jews. Jews. His own received him not. But as many as. Who's that? Anyone. In, but between verse 11 and verse 12 of John chapter 1, no one sees, few people see, the huge chasm between those two verses. One was to his own. They rejected him. So, now the way we understand that chasm of verse 11 and verse 12 is we run to Romans chapter 11, where Paul writes and says that God cut off the tree that represented Israel and grafted in another tree, Romans chapter 11. And that's where that verse 11 and verse 12 of John chapter 1 is illustrated of this postponement, is that the postponement is, is he set Israel aside And he refers to it in uh, Romans chapter 11, I believe it's verse 30 or 33, somewhere in there, about this mystery. I don't want you to be wise in your own conceits about this mystery. Mm -hmm. That blindness in part has happened unto the nation of Israel. Is that verse Mm -hmm. 33, Twyla, or what is that? Oh, Okay, so go, um, I'll find it here. Now you know I'm fallible. Oh, my. Uh, Romans chapter 11. Oh, I was way off. Okay. Um, um, Oh, I'm way off. Where am I wanting to be? I thought it was Romans chapter 11. Hold on a second. I'll get there. I'm looking right at it, and I'm not seeing it. You know why? Here we go. I was right. Romans 11. I just looked at look the wrong page, and I gave you the wrong verse. Okay, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. See that? Mystery. That's the reason nobody got John 1, 11, and 12. It's a mystery. Lest you you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happening to Israel until. That's postponement. What? The fullness of the Gentiles. Here it is right here. And when's that going to be? At the toes. That blindness in part has happened in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So when we were doing this study, um, I erased it because I didn't think we'd need it. But if we take a- Adam, we did this study, we went all the way down through. Remember when we came down from Adam, we came to David? And then David to Solomon. And Solomon, the kingdom split. All right, and when the kingdom was split, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, that kingdom was split north, ten tribes, south, referred to as Judah, Israel in the north, Judah, okay, <coughs> and the ten tribes fell into the hands of Assyria first, and there was more orthodoxy in Judah, why? Because mm-hmm. it's the seat of Jerusalem, mm-hmm. remember that's God gave Judah this track, which is Jerusalem. And so they, they, they didn't apostatize as fast. And so uh, this kingdom split. Both of them ended in destruction. And that is when 
the times of the Gentile began. Right here. Guess who was was that came in and got Judah? Do you remember? Nebuchadnezzar. So, so who had the dream? Nebuchadnezzar. And so, here's the time of the Gentiles, as Nebuchadnezzar's dream was. And so, what you have here is the time of the Gentiles. You can call it postponement theory and mock me, or, or not you guys, but whoever would do that. But Romans is pretty clear that blindness of part is happening to Israel. Next word, big word, until. Mm-hmm. Until. There is a period of time, until. And he gives us the period of time. The fullness of the Gentiles become in. And that's what Daniel's uh, interpretation was. That when it gets down to the toes, God is going to end the Gentile rule of this world by Jesus, the rock, the stone rolling down off the mountain is going to crush the ten toes. It's not break the bones. It is take over those nations. And he's going to set an eternal kingdom where he reigns. And so there are those that mock that idea of the difference between the first and the second coming in this sense of... Uh, um, 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 it's a joke, I can't tell online. But uh, to mock this idea of postponement theory, but it's not a theory, it's a biblical fact that there is a period of time between the first coming and the second coming. It's referred to as an until in Romans chapter 11, and it's referred to as a period be- between John 1 11 and John 1 12. So that's that's that period of time. And so here you have uh, Jesus coming back a second time as um, the second coming. Now, I wanted to, we started this, um, and I I would just want to finish it if we can tonight. So the first time Jesus came, it was to set up a Jewish kingdom referred to as the kingdom of heaven. That's always a confusing term because we think kingdom of heaven but the kingdom of heaven, according to Genesis, there's three heavens. One is the earth and where the birds fly. The second is where the clouds are. And the third one is where God is. To give credence to that, Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And he saw things that are not lawful for a man to see. So there's three heavens. It's given to us in Genesis and the creation. One is from the earth, well, the depths of the sea, really. The depths of the sea to where the birds fly, that's the first heaven. Where the clouds and the atmosphere and the space is, that's the second heaven. And then the third heaven is over the north star of uh, where God dwells, okay? So there's three heavens. And so when Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he's not referring to the third or the second. He's referring to the first. The kingdom of heaven is on this earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 6 again. Will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Where was the kingdom back here in the Old Testament? Was it in up in the scars? Where was the kingdom? It was on the earth, okay? Will you restore again the kingdom to Israel? David's throne was not on a cloud somewhere. It was in Jerusalem. The earth, okay? Will you restore this, this kingdom again? So, Um, The first time Jesus came, it was to set up this Jewish kingdom on this earth, but he was rejected. Now, so there's some that would mock us about the postponement theory, all right? We don't even take too much time to even address that because the Bible's so clear. Secondly, there are those that would uh, mock us because we said that Israel rejected, and as a result of that, we have the postponement theory. And they would say, nobody can reject what God does. He's sovereign. That's a word that they will use. If you have a dictionary, or, uh, uh, if you have a concordance sometime, look up sovereignty in your concordance. Tell me how many times you find that in the Bible. 
Do you always have to be weary, leery, excuse me, do you always have to be leery of someone that uses a word that's not Bible? Rapture is not found in the Bible, but it's a descriptive word, okay? Um, I prefer to use gathering, which is what the Bible refers to it as, but most people look at you like a tree full of owls, <laughs> and they go, who? Uh, they, they don't know. So if you don't say rapture, they have no clue what you're talking about. But um, I, I like Bible words. Like Trinity, look up in your concordance, that's not in the Bible. It's a descriptive word. But the Bible word for Trinity is the Godhead. I like to use Bible words. Um, you can't go wrong if you use Bible words, but it's so hard to untrain ourselves from what we've been brought up as. Uh, you'll hear me say Trinity, and you'll hear me say rapture, and you'll hear me say uh, sovereignty of God. All those words... None of them are in the Bible. And the thing is, is if you do that enough, all of a sudden you start talking about what someone thinks rather than what the Bible says. It's real easy to do that because there's a lot of very good, godly people that think. That doesn't mean they're right. They just think, okay? And uh, I always said this before. <laughs> a guy might be a nice, really nice guy, but if he doesn't have a license, I don't want him flying the jet I'm riding on, Okay? <laughs> I mean, the nicest guy is going to only go far, so far. If you don't know how to fly this, you could be a really nice guy. I'm not going to follow you out of that cockpit. Uh, so I, I, I look at that and I say, just because someone's good and godly and they're nice doesn't mean that they're right. And I don't mean that to be mean-spirited. I just mean the Bible says we're to study, to show ourselves approved, not into each other, but into God. All right, I want to know what he thinks. All right, so... I wanted to go to the second thing. The first one is those that say, oh, you're one of those postponement theory people. Um, a second one I wanted to do is hit on these people that say, your postponement theory of the second coming is the result of the rejection of humankind to God's plan. They would say, that can't happen. That doesn't exist. Because God does what he wants to do and he's not asking you what your thoughts are and so they would take that to the place of saying that you and I can't really make a decision of our will because God's plans are already set immutable and they change not and they would refer that to the sovereignty of God that he is and can because he is God make whatever rules he wants and it doesn't matter whether we like them or not or agree with them or not or even understand them or not. He's, he's sovereign. Uh, they will often use Romans chapter 9 where it says, does not the, um, well, let's just look there because I was going to butcher that. Um, verse 21, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? they would say that's a sovereignty of God verse saying that God's able to make some to honor and some to dishonor and they create this entire belief system about that God has a plan and they will take it as far as to say that his plans of sovereignty are connected with the word election and predestination and that the words predestination and election illustrate the sovereignty of God. And therefore they would say, if you were not elected to be saved, you couldn't be saved if you wanted to. And if you were elected or predestined to be lost, you couldn't be saved if you wanted to. If you were predestinated to be saved, you could not not be saved. You couldn't resist it. So they take it that man's will doesn't come into play and that it is God's sovereign will only. And so they would say, you said that the reason the first coming he didn't set up his kingdom is because the Jews rejected him and that can't happen. Because there's no human will involved that could thwart the plans of God. 
So we talked a little bit about this before, and I just want to address it. And I don't want to go into a deep study with that, but uh, take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I believe that this is the cornerstone of the issue of free will versus um, <clears throat> election, predestination, as some people refer to that as being opposing thoughts. I don't think they are, but that's the way they're presented to us, is if you're elected, you can't have free will. If you're predestined, it doesn't matter what you want. So they would say those are opposing thoughts. I don't think that's true, but I mean, I don't even think they're opposing thoughts. I think they're just mixed up. But that's what they would say. So Peter tells us, and this is a key, key verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, that election is always based on something, and it's not the arbitrary choice, decree, or fiat of a quote-unquote sovereign God. What is election based upon? Foreknowledge. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So what I would say, instead of God having a fiat or a predestinated, elected uh, decree of his will, that God has foreknowledge, which is one of his attributes, and that is omniscience. He knows everything. And that based upon his foreknowledge, his plan, based upon his foreknowledge, incorporates the will of man who were rejected. And in this case, the will of a nation that would reject him. And so that he doesn't say, well, they were going to reject me anyway, I'm just going to skip over that. He allows the rejection to take place because he's all-knowing and he allows the rejection to take place so that human will in rejecting can be judged. Do you follow what I just said? Yeah. So, and this is, you, what I just said, you can find all the way through the Old Testament. We're going to look at a few of them tonight. But you can find it over and over and over and over again. It's called conditional covenants. If you do this, then I'll do that. You know what doing this is? It's an act of the human will. When those split kingdoms, each of them separately fell, God had reached out to them multiple times to repent. But what? They would, that's will, would not. That's a will. That's an exercise of a will. When Jesus came on the scene, he looked over Jerusalem and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you a hen, death, or chicken, but you what? Would not. Will. That's an act of the will. You, you can't divorce the will of humankind from the Bible. You have to get rid of half the Bible. All right? All right. Uh, so, um, to skip through three pages of notes. Is that exciting? Okay. Uh, <laughs> amen. We're almost done. That's great. Okay. When we look at the context of predestination and election in the Bible, one thing is immediately clear. You remember I said that what is given to us is that the free will of humankind is opposite of predestination and election. I don't think that statement is true. I think it is made by someone who's confused. I think you can have election and predestination and the free will of man. Because while the confusion comes is what did he predestine and what did he or who did he elect? They, they take that question out of it and they just say election and predestination nullify the free exercise of the will. But that's because they believe that God from eternity elected some people to be saved and some people to be damned. And so they nullify the human will to make that decision. But is election and predestination ever connected to the eternal purpose of God? That would be a question that we would ask. 
and we just take this little interim in our study to examine this because before we get into the postponement theory and we look at the postponement, it's important to understand that God put this together so that we are without excuse. He offered, they rejected, and he's postponed, and he's coming the second time, and it didn't thwart his plan because his plan was based upon his foreknowledge, not an eternal decree that he made sometime, not based on foreknowledge, and that's what they would have us believe. All right, so let's just look at this for a minute. You'll run across this many times, so this little study will be helpful to you. And if you don't agree, that's fine. There are a lot of people in our church that don't believe what, what I'm getting ready to teach, which is fine. That's what makes a church nice is that not everybody has to lockstep together. Uh, there's an open door for us to be able to say, oh, well, give me some food for thought. I'm going to go study that out. So that's, that's good. That's really healthy. So it's, you're not a bad person if you don't believe this. I just want to tell you why I believe this is what the Bible says. All right. When we look at the context of predestination and election, not considering what someone wants to tell us, but what the Bible says, the context. Remember, that's one of those key principles on biblical knowledge of understanding the Bible. One of the principles is the principle of context. You can't extract a verse or a word or a phrase out of its context or if you remember when we went through that, I talked about the letter, that, this fictitious letter, that we got that said, Dear young family, I love your blue dress. And I said, I could read that and say, well, I'm a young family. I love, I, they're, they're saying I had a blue dress on. If you don't take it, if you don't put it in context, then you lose it. Because the sentence said, I love the blue dress you had on Brenda. So if I just take, leave off the Brenda and I take that out, I could imply that it was me that had the blue dress on. You have to put it in the context. And so the, I, there's a famous saying is that uh, a text without the context is a pretext. Okay? And that's a real key phrase. A text, that's a verse, out of context, not, writ, not read with the verses before and after, is a pretext. What's it a pretext for? To make up whatever you wanted to make. And if you want to go down through the different belief systems that are up, you have Catholicism, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Out of context. You have Church of Christ, um, repent and be baptized, Acts 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized everyone, even in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Taken out of context. Every one of those beliefs are built upon that text as a pretext. They've taken it out of context. They've created a whole belief system around that. So a text without the context is a pretext, meaning that you can make it say anything you want. All right? Uh, and I'm not picking on my dear brothers and sisters that are in this. I have a lot of Catholic people that know the Lord. I'm so excited for that. That's exciting. And just because someone is hung up on Acts 2, verse 38, doesn't mean that they don't know Jesus as their Savior. I'm, I'm happy, and I have fellowship with them. I have great time with them. But I don't, I want to know what the Bible says. Not for them, for me. And so a text without a context is always a pretext. You're in trouble. It's quicksand. You're going to get stuck, okay, when you don't allow the Bible to be its own teacher. All right, so let's take those words, election and predestination, not over here in the ideals of a reformist who wants to tell me what they think, but in the text and context of the Bible. Um, there's two that we want to look at. One is First Peter, where you are. And the other one is Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 29. Romans 8 and verse 29. So we're going to read the first one. Again, 1 Peter verse chapter 1 verse 2. 
What's it say? Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Just looking at that verse, which came first, the election or the foreknowledge? Foreknowledge. Elect according to. Right? Foreknowledge came first, and then election. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. That's the word election. We're looking at the word election and predestination. What did we get again? For whom he did for no, he also did. Okay, what is election and predestination in the context of Scripture always connected with? First, the foreknowledge of God. It's always based upon the foreknowledge of God. And that's an important thing. This is not about edict. This is not about fiat. It is not about uh, decree. This is not about somewhere in eternity, which is not, you can't even make that statement. That suggests that there was a time in eternity. Eternity doesn't have time. So you can't say somewhere in eternity, because then, then you're putting time in it. It doesn't work. But that's the saying, is that somewhere in eternity, God decided those that were going to be saved and those that were going to be damned. And you, you can't find that in the Bible. It's not there. But there is a huge group of people, Baptists are among the biggest ones, that believe that. They're called reformists. Okay? And they would have you believe that that has nothing to do with the foreknowledge of God. It has to do with the edict or the decree of God. The election and predestination is based upon the decree of God. But the Bible always tells us based upon his foreknowledge. Okay? God knows everything. Now, the supposition that a reformist would say that knowing something is the same as determining it. So once you read those two verses and you say it's based upon the foreknowledge of God, then they got to fix that. <laughs> okay? Because their whole, their whole belief system crashes. So then they have to say, well, foreknowledge, what it really means is a decree. Do you see what I just did? That's the old, we were talking about the kingdom of the cults. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what they do. They, they won't ever go, uh-oh. They'll always go to something else. So here what they do is they change and say that foreknowledge is about uh, determining or decreeing something. All right? But let's look at Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and let's look at verse 23. This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And verse 23, look at verse 22. Who's he talking to? Israel. You men of Israel, okay. And then in verse 23, who's the him? Jesus. Him, Jesus of Nazareth, verse 22, him being delivered by the determinate counsel, there's determined, uh-oh, we got a problem, and foreknowledge of God. So the Bible's always the best teacher. If you don't forsake the Bible, you can be uneducated, and you can put those educated people who've been educated beyond their intelligence uh, to rest. Now, they won't rest, but, but I mean... They'll keep trying to find a way to get around it. But you can't say that foreknowledge is the same as determined because Peter said that they're not. By the determinate counsel, all right, and foreknowledge of God. In fact, the verse is saying that what determines the determination of God is his foreknowledge. Okay? All right. Um, uh, let's look again at 1 Peter chapter 1.
Now look at verse 18. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, that's religion, okay, <laughs> but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Who was foreordained? You and me? Who was foreordained, Jimmy? Christ. Jesus Christ was foreordained. See, I, I don't think that there's a, a contradiction between election, predestination, or foreordination and the free will of man. I don't think there's a conflict there. That's been made a conflict by those who want to say that there's that you and I were what he elected, what he foreordained before the foundation of the world. All right. Um, look at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Look at verse 17. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto him, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and to the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. If you want to know what he determined, that's what he determined. It's about Christ. It isn't about you and me. It is about Christ. And that's the reason Jesus could say, even before it happened, based upon his foreknowledge, this is the reason I was sent into the world, and because of my foreknowledge, I know exactly what they're going to do. When he rode on the donkey into Jerusalem and they laid palm leaves down in front of him, he didn't say, oh, this is... This is exactly what I want. And then when they said, crucify him, he went, oh no, how did this happen? That's not what happened. He was under no illusion when they were laying palm leaves in front of him what ultimately was going to happen because of his foreknowledge. He knew. All right. Uh, the two words are not the same, determined and um, uh, foreknowledge. Two different things. If the two words were the same, um, how can we explain the events that occurred in 1 Samuel? Look at 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. While you're turning there, let me give you the background. David is in Achilliah and hears that King Saul is coming down to get him. This is when he was running from King Saul. David is in Keliah, hears it, King Saul's coming to get him, and so he calls for the ephod. I don't know if you know, the ephod is like the, the linen robe that the priest would wear, and attached to that linen robe, the ephod, was the breastplate that had the 12 stones on it. And underneath that breastplate, a leather uh, material, underneath that breastplate were pockets. And there were two items, small items. Many people think they're like stones. Anybody's guess because it doesn't say. That are called the Urim and the Themim. And so the priest would put those in the pockets of the breastplate that was held on by the, uh, we might call it apron of the ephod, a linen garment, all connected together, put those in there. And God would reveal right from wrong, which way, wrong way, with the Urim and the Thurim. And uh, there's many speculations of how that uh, was accomplished. There's nothing definitive that I can find in the Bible. Maybe, but I don't, I've never found it. Uh, you just have to, by faith, believe that when the priest would ask, or whoever it was that would ask, with the linen ephod, and the breastplate, and the Urim Thurm, that God would reveal by one or the other 
one is guilty, one is uh, not guilty, one is yes, one is no, that they always were able to divine what God's will was with the Urim and Thurim, okay? So David's in Keli, he hears that Saul's coming to get him, he calls for the ephod and inquires of the Lord. Look at verse number 11, no, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 23. This is what he asked of the Lord. Will the men of Keliah deliver me up into his hands, Saul's hands? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Period. All right. What comes next is interesting. Because notice what it says in uh, verse number uh, 13. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, and he forbade to go forth. Now, was God's plans thwarted? He said he's going to come down. But he didn't go down. Why? Because David left. To say that the plans of God are fiat, decrees, that can't be broken makes it very hard to understand the Bible because the opposite is given to us in the Bible. And here this is this, the foreknowledge of God. If, if there had been a fourth question in verse 12 that David asked, maybe the Lord would have said, answered, they will deliver thee up, or excuse me, verse uh, 11, the Lord said, he will come down unless you leave. <laughs> okay? But he didn't ask that. He just said, will they come down? Yes, they will. Verse 12, then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. And so David left, and so Saul didn't come down, and Keilah didn't deliver him up. These are the things that uh, don't fit uh, the 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 theology of the reformists. It just won't work. And so they have to start doing it. Well, the foreknowledge and determination are the one and the same. That, but they're not. We know that from the scripture. I'm not trying to be a bully, and I'm not trying to be king of the mountain. I'm just saying these are questions that need to be answered if you have a reformist view. And the reason that we're doing it is not to poke the finger in the eye of a reformist by any means. I'd much rather have them my brother in Christ and fellowship with them because they love the Lord. There, there's no question about that. But if we say that the reason that there is a second coming over here with a period of time in between it is that the Jews rejected him, then the reformists would say, no, they didn't reject him. It was God's plan. Okay? And we want to say, no, we want to see this in the Bible. That's not how it works. All right. Um, because God is omniscient, he could have answered David's question. If foreknowledge is the same as determined, something that cannot be changed, we should be able to follow this story to see the determination unchanged by the decree of God. But according to verse 13, uh, it didn't happen. So we understand by reading the two verses together that King Saul would have come down if David and his men decided to stay. What was that an exercise of? Free will. Free will. They left. We made a decision. If he's coming down, we're not staying in Dodge, man. We're getting out of Dodge. <laughs> we're leaving town, okay? An exercise of free will. And uh, this is always an important thing as we look at it. But each of them, Saul and David, did something else. Clearly, foreknowledge is not the same as determined or predestined. So returning to these two words, election and predestination, the first thing that we notice 
is that they are both based upon the foreknowledge of God. That is, God knows, because he's omniscient, something before he determines, elects, or predestinates anything. And this is so huge. God knows before he determines, elects, or predestinates anything. All right? This is the Bible, not what someone tried to teach us, but what the Bible says. Making election or predestination an arbitrary act of a sovereign God is not supported, from my understanding, in the scriptures. No matter where you find the words election and predestination in the Bible, they're always, always to be understood in the context of foreknowledge, not an arbitrary decree. Furthermore, let's examine the four places that the word predestination is used. Just so we can say, all right, we've learned some things. Let's put this to the test and see if it's true. So the first place is Romans chapter 8. We've looked at that. We're going to look at it again here. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And look at verse 29 again. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Oh, I forgot to give you your book, Gary. <laughs> That's all right. I got one. Okay, all right. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, what came first? Foreknowledge, okay. He also did predestinate. All right. Let's read all the way down to verse 30. To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified then he also glorified. All right, so if we look at that verse there and we understand that verse, then we see that foreknowledge was first and then predestination occurred and several things were predestinated. All right, the first thing that was predestinated to be conformed into the image of his son. The second thing that was predestinated was called. Third thing is justified. Fourth thing is glorified. Okay? So that's what predestination did. Those things in the text. Okay? Look at it. That's one place where predestination is used twice. It's only used four times in the Bible. Let's look at another place. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And let's look at verse 5. So, we're conformed to the image of the Son. And then he goes on um, in verse 30, called, justified, glorified. Now here in Ephesians chapter 1, notice in verse number 5, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What was the next thing that we're predestinated to? The adoption of children, right? All right, then let's look the fourth time it's mentioned, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being, here's the word again, predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. All right, this predestination is an inheritance in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated. That it was predestinated, we have an inheritance. You know what's missing in the four times that it's mentioned in the Bible? The word predestination? What's missing? That Jimmy was predestinated to be saved or lost. Or that... Is your name Mark or... Oh no, the wrong one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mark works. <laughs> Mark 2. So, Mark 2, yeah. But that's what's missing. We've, saw, we've looked at every place predestination is mentioned in the Bible, and not one time is there any reference to him predestinating someone to do anything as far as get saved or get lost. But what in, instead, what is predetermined or predestined? Well, what, number one, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Two, to be called. 
Three, to be justified. Four, to be glorified. Five, to inheritance. So what God predestinated was that we were going to be called, that we were going to be justified, that we were going to be glorified, and that we were going to get an inheritance, and that the process of accomplishing that is that we were going to be conformed to the image of God. That's what he predestinated. There isn't anything in the Bible that ever talks about being predestinated to being saved or lost or to do one thing versus another against what your will would be. It's not there. The predestination based upon the foreknowledge of God, we've already established that. Predestination is based upon the foreknowledge of God. God all-knowing. And this is it. I'll give it to you more simply. Jimmy, God predestinated that if you hear the truth and you exercise your will to accept the truth, that God's going to conform you to the image of his son, that he is going to justify you from your sin, that he is one day going to glorify you with a new body, and that he's going to give you an inheritance that's incorruptible that passes not away. That's what he predestinated. Now that's about as simple as I can make it. <laughs> All right, Because that's what the Bible says. Well, is there any indication in the Bible that there is this process that goes on. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Ephesians chapter 1, okay? Ephesians chapter 1, and notice, if you would, verse number 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his what? Because we just looked at this according to the purpose of his will and after his own will, and he doesn't ask counsel, he does it, okay? Having made known unto us the mystery of his what? His will. This is his will according to the good pleasure which he has purposed in himself. Did he ask you, Jerry, if, what you thought about being conformed to the image of Christ? Jimmy, did he ask you if you thought that it was fair or not fair to be justified? Uh, uh, Mark or Frank or whatever your name is. Uh, did he ask you if you thought it was right or fair or it should be that you should be glorified one day? No, he didn't ask any of us our opinion about that. It, he made it after a counsel of his own will. And this is the way we said it. If you believe on me and trust me, then I'm going to give you the image of my dear son. I'm going to justify you from your sin. I am going to one day glorify you. You're drop this robe of flesh and rise to be with me. And I'm going to give you an inheritance that's incorruptible. That's what he predestinated. Okay. So, notice what it says. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed himself, didn't ask us permission, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one... All things in who? In Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now notice the progression. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He didn't ask us. Okay. And what is this? Verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first, say the word with me, trusted. trusted in Christ. Now follow the progression. In whom also, in whom he also trusted, what came first, trust or you heard the word? You heard the word first. And then you trusted, right? Yeah. And what did you, what was the word of truth? It was the gospel of your what? Salvation. And then after you heard the word and you trusted in Jesus, what did you do with what you heard? You believed. And then after you believed, what happened? You were sealed. Did, did you say, wait a minute, I don't want you to seal me. <laughs> huh? No, he, he's not asking for our permission. He, he made that decision. It was his will to do that. And it's so clear in the, scripture, in the scriptures, and it shows the progression down here, that salvation is always a work of human will. That we hear the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. We trust after we believe. And as a result of that, we're sealed. And look at verse number 10. We're given an inheritance. Excuse me, verse 11. We're given an inheritance. It all works together. It goes together seamlessly like that all the time. 
All right. Now we're way out of time. I'm sorry. I got got going. I was so excited. I, I can't. Now. So we're going to have to stop right there, but just so you see, again, the four times that predestination is mentioned in the Bible is Romans 8, 29, and 30. That's two times. And Ephesians 1, 5, that's the third time. Ephesians 1, 11, that's the fourth time. Those are the only four times it's mentioned in the Bible. To create a doctrine that everything begins with predestination out of only four times mentioned in the Bible is to me a, a little weird. <laughs> but you take a text out of context and you get a pretext. And you create a doctrine that's not there. All right. Now, those that would not agree with what I just said, and there are many, there are many. I love them, they love me, I hope. Uh, I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm just saying. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I have no problem if you're persuaded differently. I'm making my argument because I get to. Um, and, and I just say this, is that one of the pushbacks to what I just said that we would get is they're going to run to the Old Testament. They're going to find somebody in the Old Testament to disprove me. Anybody got an idea who that's going to be? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. All right. And so next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at Pharaoh and we're going to see if their argument, and it's a sincere argument, I don't mean to mock them, if their argument holds up. Now, because this is real important. Again, what we're trying to establish is, could this have really happened? I mean, honestly, could did Jesus have the whole way prepared for his kingdom to be accepted the first time he came? Or was he surprised? No. All right. Could he have had the whole thing prepared and known that they would be rejecting and say, I'm going to come back again? But in between, I'm going to provide a postponement thing, a parenthesis. And in that parenthesis, I'm going to do something that's going to shock the socks off of you. And it's comprised in John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. So we'll look at that. So we're going to look at Pharaoh. That would be one of their objections. The other one would be, hath not the potter power over the clay? So we're going to address that too. And uh, so we'll look at those two arguments that they would have. And we will see what my proposition has been is that God's foreknowledge allows the plan of God to go forward parallel to human will. I say that again. God's foreknowledge allows his plan to run parallel like two railroad tracks to human will. foreknowledge is the key to see it. Okay? Alright. Way over time. I do apologize in some respects. Everybody get a prayer list tonight? <laughs> that is prayer meeting. <laughs> prayer meeting and Bible study. Did you get one? Okay. You got one? Yes. Okay. We got plenty. Do you want more than one? You're allowed to have two. <laughs> so, um, for those who've been here, we've been praying for some weeks about Lisa's brother. He passed away, I believe it was last Friday. And um, so, uh, please pray for Lisa and her family. Um, does anybody know if any arrangements, have you heard anything about the arrangements that have been made? Okay. Um, then also Rosalie and Elaine. Elaine used to go to church here. She now lives in a different state. But uh, Rosalie's uh, sister, they are sisters, and they lost uh, one of their sisters. I understand Rosalie's the oldest in the, in the family. I think so. And she's lost uh, several of her siblings. So 
uh, please pray in prayer for her and for the family. Uh, Vonda has not responded um, to the rehab as well as they needed and wanted. And um, I think that they may be moving her to a hospital in Cincinnati. So please pray for them. That's a, just a tough situation. You, you get your hopes up when you see what looks like maybe some response and then the next day you go in and there's none. And uh, that's a, it's a tough situation. Uh, but pray for, for them. Um, Beth uh, is uh, going in for knee surgery on the 9th. Um, so keep her in prayer, uh, which be, I think it's next Thursday, the 9th. Fifth is Sunday, so. Um, and then Lisa also needs prayer with regard to her daughter. Um, going through some difficult time there. Doris had surgery. She's recovering from the surgery. Um, pray for her. Say that you know the connection is um, Susan and Rob. Rob's mom, husband, mom. Okay? Rob's mom's husband mom, Doris. Mm -hmm. I don't, is that one of those three times removed things? I don't know what you call that. But anyway, so there's so you know the connection that um, uh, Sandy, who is on, uh, she's on live stream a lot with this Facebook, that is Rob's mom. Mm -hmm. And this is her mother-in-law, Doris, okay? Um, Susan has been really sick. If you didn't notice, she wasn't here Sunday with uh, bronchitis, remember her. Um, uh, Jan's going to have surgery on her eye the 16th of June. Keep her in your uh, prayers. And then Cheryl's uh, stepdaughter, Leslie, um, had the MRI that found several bulging discs and some fractured vertebrae. Uh, so keep her in prayer. Uh, Shirley's at home for right now. Linda's still in the hospital as far as I know. Uh, Brenda's sister-in-law still has not found a donor. And Judy Johnson is at home resting. Keep uh, that family in prayer. And then several of the other prayer requests are down there below the needs of the church. Others we've been asked to pray for. Continue to pray for Ben Wilson. Um, others that are down there. Tracy. Okay. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer if we can. Father, we come before you tonight. We're so thankful for your word and how clear it can become. And I know that not everybody sees the clarity that we have espoused tonight, and that's okay. Uh, one day we'll get to heaven, we'll figure out who understood the word um, correctly. And maybe there'll be a little movement on everybody's part. It is not our intent, Lord, to um, be against someone or a belief. It's just to find the truth. And, uh, Lord, if there are people that um, listen to this broadcast tonight and take exception to the things that we've said, it's, it's not the end of the world. It's been argued for centuries, and it will be argued after I'm gone. Um, one day when we get to heaven, we're known even as we're known, it will be settled. But from our understanding of the scriptures, I believe this is a correct uh, way and a correct approach to your word, consistent through Genesis to Revelation. And I thank you, Lord, for it. I do pray, Father, that you continue to help us in this study, that in the <laughs> all the rabbit trails we take, we don't lose sight of the main purpose, and that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, thank you for allowing us to go through this on Wednesday night and how wonderfully it dovetails into our uh, Sunday morning Sunday school, fell Sunday school class. And uh, so we kind of get a double shot each week. And thank you, Lord, for that study. I do pray, Father, that you'd be with Lisa and Dale and the whole family as they go through the loss of uh, Lisa's brother and also their conflict and the uh, troubles uh, that their daughter is going through. I just pray, Father, that you'd be with them. I, I'm sure that it, it's hard to maintain uh, the normal life, work, eat, responsible things and have all this going on around you. So I pray, Father, that you bless them. They're special people to us and dear to our heart and ask that you'd be with them. But we pray also for Rosalie, and uh, I cannot imagine, other than I remember my grandmother saying, 
I can't bear to see another one of my kids die. And uh, she had witnessed the death of several of her children, and it was just too much for her to bear. I can imagine that in some respects, uh, Rosalie's going through that same thought that uh, by order of birth, she should be the one that goes first, and yet God, you've spared her. Uh, but in the midst of that, she has a grieving, grieving heart. And I pray, Father, that you bless her and help her comfort her, Lord, uh, come near unto her and help her, Father, find her strength and uh, you. And bless, I pray, Marilyn, if she uh, cares for her. Uh, may you just bless them, I pray, the both. I pray for Beth as she prepares to go through the surgery that so many others have gone through. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would give her relief uh, from uh, the agony that she's going through right now. Uh, give her strength and comfort and bless her. Uh, Father, for Doris, as she uh, recovers from this surgery on her legs, uh, Lord, what a special person that is. And uh, I just ask, Lord, that you give her a swift and quick recovery uh, from that. Be with uh, Susan as well as she bears uh, some responsibility of care, but mostly um, I pray, Father, for um, Sandy and just ask, Lord, that you would help her as she becomes the primary caregiver. Lord, I pray for Susan as she's uh, sick due to bronchitis, and uh, that could be very, very hard to breathe and coughing and talking. I just pray that you give her. For Jan, as she gets ready for this surgery in her eye, uh, Father, I pray that you uh, give uh, the doctors wisdom as they get in there. If they run into anything that they have not already planned to run into, that they uh, would have wisdom from above to address it. Pray, Father, for Cheryl and the stepdaughter situation that she's going through. I uh, pray, Father, that you give uh, the, the neurologist wisdom as she uh, uh, seeks to find a way to uh, minimize or limit the pain. Pray, Father, for Shirley as you continue to help her recover at home. For Linda as uh, the doctors try to find out exactly what the cause of her uh, problems are. Just bless her, Father, I pray. And uh, for Debbie, uh, Brenda's sister-in-law, uh, looking for a kidney. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you provided her the opportunity to do, chemo, uh, to do uh, dialysis at home. Uh, but, Lord, uh, it, there are still limitations based upon that. And I pray, Father, that uh, her health uh, would improve as she gets approved for uh, a, a transplant and then as she finds a donor. God, bless, I pray that you be with her and bless her with that. Lord, our hearts always go out to Judy and add and uh, how many years they served so faithfully and, and here at First Baptist. And now uh, their life has taken a turn for uh, a different chapter in their book of life. And I just ask, Lord, that you be with them in their needs uh, right now, special needs, Lord, minister to them. Lord, our, we'd be remiss if we didn't remember our young people and the moms group and uh, those that will be singing specials this summer. Uh, for our VBS staff that are in high gear to prepare uh, for uh, this year's VBS. Pray that you be with Stevie and Anna both as their co-workers together. Uh, Lord, be with Becky's granddaughter, uh, mother-in-law, Christine. Uh, Lord, I, just such a terrible disease, cancer, and I pray, Father, that you be with her and alleviate some of the pain. Be with Tracy as she continues to receive treatment for her lung cancer and uh, also the possibility that it may have spread. I just pray, Father, that you'd be with her. For Anne and her uh, situation with uh, um, uh, her good friends, uh, I know that, Lord, the loss of a loved one is hard to deal with, and I pray, Father, that you give Lydia strength. I pray also, Lord, for Ben, um, starting to get their lives in order for what they've been told will be an eventual and soon end. Uh, my heart just breaks for them. And, uh, Lord, there's so many things down on this earth that we don't understand. That is a song where I wrote, we'll understand better by and by. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you be with that family, the mom and dad, the wife, the children. Lord, I pray that you be with them. Uh, we rejoice with Landon, who uh, is still on a feeding tube, but has completed all of the first round of his treatment and doing well. Pray, Father, for Connie, uh, Joan's friend, uh, and her uh infection in her foot. Uh, for Shirley Cormican, who's uh, going to have 
surgery in August. I just pray, Father, that you'd uh, give her strength and that, Lord, you'd also make it possible for a quick, thorough uh, surgery and a quick recovery. Father, I pray for Judy as she continues to go through rehab at Dorothy Love. Uh, be with her and Ken and administer their needs. Lord, we offer to you our service this Sunday as we recognize our graduates and the fellowship that we have together starting a new series uh, Sunday morning and pray, Father, that your uh, will be done in all those things, that you would lift us up by your word, our fellowship one with another, by the singing of these songs that speak of the truth of what God has done. Uh, Father, honor your word and honor your people as we seek to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much tonight on an extended prayer meeting night, and I uh, hope that uh, you will start, uh, be with us next week, Sunday morning at 9.15. God bless you. Have a great evening.